Okay, so welcome to episode five of our interview series, coach interview series. Uh, today we have two special guests. We are joined by Tom Hartley and Gary Piggott. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves in a moment. Uh, just in terms of what we're looking to do uh, through discussion today, about an hour or so, um, just a general coaching discussion really, and we'll take you through some key topics that we decide in advance. Um, and as always, you know, get in touch with County FA if you've got any questions or you want to engage a little bit further on any of the topics discussed. So, uh, Gary, we'll start with you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, yeah, uh, as Andy said, my name's Gary Piggott. I'm the FA County Coach Developer um, within Essex. Um, so FA role. Um, and my role really is to to collaborate with the county FA uh, around coach education, CPD, um, overseeing the tutor workforce and um, the delivery of courses. So that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Thanks, Gary. Uh, yeah, and uh, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm Tom Hartley. I'm a senior coach developer at UK Coaching. Uh, within my role at the moment, I guess ultimately it's to support coaches to fulfil their potential and to, to work with coach developers uh, to help them think about the best way that they can support coaches on their, their journey of development. Brilliant. Thanks very much, both of you. Thanks for your time. Uh, so we'll get straight into it. And Tom, you mentioned journey there. It's a good place to start. So if you don't mind, um, just take it in turns, just share a little bit about your coaching journey and how you've got to, to be in the roles that you're in now. So Tom, if we start with you. Of course. Um, yeah, I, I consider myself really fortunate in, in terms of where I'm at now and, and where I started. Uh, so uh, cast your minds back, 1993. Uh, playoff final, Swindon Town versus Leicester City. Uh, that was my first game. Uh, Swindon won, promoted to the Premier League. It's kind of the era of Glenn Hoddle as, as the manager. Uh, and that was it for me. Um, it had to be football and it also had to be Swindon Town. Um, so for, forgive me for any any Colchester <laughs> fans listening in. I'm, uh, <laughs> um, so, so um, yeah, I, I kind of, I was always really clear that, that I think the, the most young boys play, playing was was the the thing I wanted to do but I think I got to 15 realized that wasn't going to happen I think everybody else kind of realized that a few years in advance and neglected to tell me um but yeah so started coaching at Swindon um on the holiday courses and I'm sure where lots of coaches have been uh kind of on a February half term minus one putting up Samba goals um and and kind of went down that road of getting my FA level one level two level three uh went out and coached in the states for a while um, and, and in all honesty, probably wasn't the best coach in the world. i would got my level three, probably had my, my L plates on still and didn't quite know what good coaching looked like. Um, the aim was always to get that full time job in football. Uh, so when I came back back to England, um, was really fortunate to, to stumble across uh, and it was very much being in the right place at the right time, stumble across the FA skills program, which I'm sure lots of people listening will remember. So kind of the, 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 the idea of Sir Trevor Brooking and, and uh, was a programme aimed at five to 11 year olds, um, helping them be the best person they could be and helping them fulfil their potential. So I had three different jobs with skills as, as a coach, as a team leader, and then, then managing the relationships with some county FAs. And I felt so fortunate when I was there. It just felt like a, a 10 year apprenticeship, um, learning all the time being in a team of coaches who were actually you're coaching for 20 hours a week, but the rest of your week is about planning and review and, and just, just discussing coaching, which was, was an amazing time. Um, and I think if you look at people who were involved in the skills program and supported the skills program, the journeys they've been off on since have been quite astounding. Um, then came to Arsenal. So worked at Arsenal for three years, managing their women and girls programs. Um, so that was everything from supporting grassroots clubs, coaching in schools and, and we, we developed a, a huge player development program which sat just underneath the Girls Academy um, and then more recently joined UK Coaching um, and, and I'm three months into the role here so I joined just as lockdown started so I met my boss on day one and uh, since then the whole job has been home-based which has been a different experience to say the least <laughs> um, which uh, which gets us to kind of where, where, where we're at now. Brilliant thanks very much that Tom and I know there's Obviously, lots in between, um, which perhaps we'll unpick as, as we go through a little bit as well. Um, and then over to you, Gary, just a bit about the journey so far. OK, um, so very much, very much aligned to, to 
a lot of Tom's journey really. Um, uh, failed footballer, um, mm. had aspirations of, of wanting to play at the, at the highest level, ne- was never going to happen. Um, always been very, very passionate about football um, as a youngster. And I think somebody sparked that, that or ignited that flame within me. Um, so sort of fast forward into to being an adult um, and having children. And then I had a son who went on to want to play football um, um, and almost stumbled into to managing his team and coaching his team. So, um, and that really, again, ignited that passion for wanting to to help him and, and others uh, to really have a good experience, enjoy what they was doing um, and just love football or love any sport, to be perfectly honest. Um, so from that, I, I sort of thought to myself, similar to Tom's story, um, I I took the took the team down to Southend United and on a like a Saturday morning and they did um, uh, Saturday morning coaching and then you got a ticket for the game etc etc so I got talking to a guy called Frankie Banks who was the the, um, the head of the football in the community scheme who he's, he's still about now and I suppose he was one of my first sort of mentors and he, he gave me some part-time coaching um, and that's how I got into to, to coaching on a full-time basis so I I did part-time more likely for about a year um, had to rely I suppose on, on my wife uh, my wife's Paul uh, you know with which none of us would be where we are now uh, wherever that might be um, and it gradually became a full-time role so I then become a full-time football and community uh, officer down there um, that led to uh, doing my first qualification, which was a prelim badge, so I go I go back a bit further than Tom. Uh, uh, so that was the f- first qualification before the level twos came in. Um, so that was an interesting insight, and it, it's obviously the face of coaching has changed out of all recognition. If I'm perfectly honest, um, worked with the South End Centre of Excellence. Um, then I got a full time role um, with South End. Uh, then we went into a partnership with Basildon District Council to run a football development scheme there and was asked to, to head that up. So then I, I sort of headed that up and had, you know, to, to organise everything. And that sent me on a very steep learning curve, but was very, very interesting. So having to talk to, you know, sort of chief execs and heads, heads of leisure services and things like that. So and really took me out of my comfort zone whilst planning, organising, facilitating everything that goes with a community scheme. Um, uh, I then worked there for five years. Then I went to Essex FA, um, spent two years running an an Ipswich Development Centre, uh, spent 12 and a half years at Essex FA and then got the role at the FA. So I've sort of curtailed that a little bit for the sake of the uh, footage. <laughs> no problem. No, brilliant. Thanks for that. Thanks both. So um, there's loads of stuff that jumped out of there. I was just jotting away with some sort of keywords. So you just you mentioned there parent, which a lot of people who, you know, hopefully listening in or watching will, a lot of the people that we deal with within the county are parent coaches, volunteer coaches. Um, you mentioned, you both mentioned about passion, passionate for the game or sport, football in general. Um, the fact that you both want to help, which, you know, a key trait for any coach that you want to help others to to reach their potential in whatever that may be and however that may look. Um, and also just the varied experiences. So those that perhaps aspirational career type coach, if that's the right phrase, um, hopefully that's valuable to hear that there's those different pathways and routes and just conscious that you know, those that will listen and are volunteer coaches and perhaps their experiences are very different and they're just trying to get by. And I think some of the stuff that we'll discuss here, I think hopefully will be quite useful. So just on the journey side of things, is there any key milestones or memories that really stuck with you? Um, Gary, you mentioned there about 
the experiences with the local authority and, and perhaps talking to people that might have been a little bit out of the comfort zone. So to, to either of you, really, just any key things that stuck that perhaps benefited your coaching journey so far? Yeah, go on, Tony, you go first, mate. All right, I'll kick us off. Do you know what? I think I was just thinking about this when, when Gary was talking, and I think I've always had that aim, or I, I always had that aim about having a full-time job in coaching. That was the that was the, the what I wanted to chase after. But since getting there, I feel like my journey's been a bit more like a treasure map than a flag in the top of Everest. Um, and with that, I guess I, I know I want to make a difference and support people and inspire some change and one of the big things for me is about challenging the status quo to an extent. Do we always have to do things the way we've always done them? So I think for me, almost not having a a, a, a flag in the top of Everest, an exact point of where to get to being useful because you can discover stuff along the way. Um, and linked to some challenges. Yeah, when you when when I reflect back, there's been there's been a few wow moments, but, but there's definitely been two or three ouch moments as well, which I think are really important because if, if you use them in the right way, they can they can have a big impact on on the direction you choose to go in after that. Um, so I think for, for me, I kind of there's, there's there's a few that that spring to mind. One one coaching in in a prison environment that that's been fascinating for me. So I, I, I see it as being being really fortunate to be asked to to go and coach there. So I, I was coaching in a women's prison in in South London. Um, I delivered three courses, if you like, which were bespoke there, and I felt very much like an alien in their world. So being able to step into an environment which is heavily controlled, where maybe us on the outside of that might have some fixed views about people in prison uh, and the things that they might have done. Um, and I was like anybody would be quite nervous and apprehensive before going in there. And, and I think it had all the potential to be a huge ouch moment, that, that whole experience. Um, but by going in and trying to create an environment where people felt like they could just be themselves, and and I think a lot of prison is about identity. So so people perhaps lose what is their identity and, and the, the criminal justice system helps them find potentially a new one. Well, the football and using football as a vehicle help people potentially be themselves. It using sport and playing playing games and, and just just by building good relationships kind of got rid of some of those layers of stigma or or um I guess that, that kudos that maybe some people carry around with them in prison. Um, and as a coach, it, it really, really affirmed with me about people first. Um, so, so someone said to me recently, if you, if you support people or look after people, the athletic qualities within them will take care of themselves, which really resonates with me. And, and I think that that prison environment amplifies um, and exaggerates all the stuff we can do in the outside in the normal world uh, because the impact with, with these people is is really different. So so the, the, the prison world has been really interesting. It's presented loads of challenges. Um, and then I think I think um, coach education to an extent. I'm relatively new to delivering coaching courses. I haven't got half the amount of years of experience as Gary. Um, but um, I, I started delivering FA Level 1 courses maybe four or five years ago. Um, and I felt like an imposter. I felt like, who, who am I to stand in front of a room of coaches and tell them how to coach? But that is exactly it. It's not It's not that. It's not be, me being a tutor saying, listen to me and forget everything you knew. It, it's saying, well, actually, you as coaches and as people who are parents who have been roped into taking your daughter's uh, five-a-side team or, or people who have been supporting their grassroots club and want, want to, to get a qualification to go with it, You've got all the answers yourselves. Um, and a big thing for me was was moving from that point where I was thinking, right, I need to teach people to actually, I need to ask people some great questions, which helps them appreciate stuff for themselves and understand understand where they're at. Um, so I'd say, yeah, there, there have probably been two moments relatively in the last kind of five years or so that have really been important for me because they've, they've made me really think about my role as a coach developer. It's not the person who goes and tells people how to do stuff. It's the one who sits back and asks some questions and, and helps people navigate their own journey. That's brilliant. I think one that's one thing we get quite a lot of positive feedback from a county point of view is when people go on the level one, level two, whatever it may be, is actually the pathway now, it just gets them, just diverts curiosity, just gets them thinking about what they already do. And like you said, putting the people at the centre of everything. And some of the stuff that comes in around how it's made people think, not just as a coach, but as a parent or has impacted on their work, 
in a in a positive way is fantastic and it just goes to show that, that content that's out there now is you know we've spoke about it recently it's, it's always been there but perhaps it's just never been brought to the fore in part um and, and gary what about you has there been any sort of key moments uncomfortable challenges along the way oh yeah loads um <laughs> i think I'll, I'll try and pull a couple out um i mean i, I just uh, you know when when tom was talking there about standing up and feeling like an imposter and thinking you know who am i to to tell people i think that just shows the 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 empathy that that, that you've got tom for other people's feelings really and i i, I remember being in a the biggest lesson that that i learned before i was a, a an fa tutor was um i think i was working at i might i was either working at basildon um district council doing a football development scheme or they just started essex fa and there used to be i don't know if you both remember the tops um yeah yeah training. Yeah, yeah yeah so i went to train to be a tops tutor and it was down in um, South London somewhere, Barclays Sports Ground. And I won't say who the tutor was um, because it'd be quite detrimental. <laughs> uh, but but when, I, when I sat down and there were some quite well-known people who was doing the course as well um, to, to be a, a, a top tutor. And um, the content was fine the training was fine however the first 15 minutes um, we spent listening to the tutor tell us about himself which um, it sort of totally lost me for the rest of the day because I, I wasn't really there to know what he knew and for him to tell me what he knew I was there for him to help um, me learn and get more information and become better at what I was doing and I think that was a really powerful lesson for me. And I'd like to think that the one thing that I do bring to, to, to courses is I've got that the same empathy as Tom. And I, I'd never forget that I was always in the same place as them people in front of me at some point in my, my journey. And I always remember how I felt in that place. Um, and you, you don't turn up to um, to courses or to events to for somebody to you know demean what you're saying and everybody's opinion should be appreciated and it should be us that's got the skill to sort of circumnavigate certain issues uh, to bring people around to maybe a different way of thinking and that's the skill of an educator um, so it's not it's not people don't want to know what we know people want us to help them learn and I think that's a massive um, learning that I've done and two two other things that really stand out for me when I was working at the um, the, the football development scheme in Basildon um, I got a partnership with um, so I did some disability coaching um, and I did a partnership with Charlton Athletic and a guy called Barry Simmons and every Saturday morning for two years we coached a disabled uh, footballers group and that was a huge learning curve for me um, and, and some of these, you know, there was one lad there, this Chris, who it took two people to hold him up. And if he kicked the ball four times in an hour, that was a massive achievement. So I, I used to sort of go home and, and then berate my kids for not doing anything and not appreciating what they've got, you know, which is wrong. But it just made me realise how lucky they were and how lucky I am to have two children, able-bodied children. Um, and the, the power of that was huge. And, and that was more like the, the most satisfying coaching I've ever done. Albeit, I didn't really, it wasn't coaching per se in the normal vernacular, if you like. But that's a huge learning curve. And one of the other ones was, um, I had some conversations with a couple of schools in, in Basildon. Um, and they, they was having a lot of, they had a couple of classes within their school with and they had a lot of disaffected kids in the school and, um, you know, couldn't get him involved in, in learning and stuff like that. And I said, well, have you thought about taking football into the classroom? I said, you know, initially, did, did they like football? And most of them loved football. Um, so I said, well, have you thought about taking football into the classroom? So I come up with some worksheets after we agreed I'd have a go at it. We come up with some worksheets around, you know, geography and maths and stuff like that. 
And I know that Arsenal have done it now, and I think Man United have done it now. Um, so I didn't do it to the degree to the de degree that they have, and I didn't have sort of glossy stuff. But I had worksheets, and part of the that was the carrot for the for the kids. The football was the carrot, and as long as they did their classwork, then we'd have we'd have three quarters of an hour football after, and it was really powerful the effect that I saw football have on these 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 young people, these young children. Um, and I suppose it just showed that they also that maybe we need to appreciate that people have got different interests and people don't necessarily conform or want the traditional way of learning. And we have to think about different ways of maybe tapping into their needs and wants. Brilliant. So that's, yeah, that's... Gary, that's, 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 sorry, Andy. Go for it. No, I was just going to, going to say what you mentioned there, Andy, uh, Gary, sorry, and, and what you were talking about in terms of coach development and, and tutoring and, and actually everyone's different and everyone's at a different point. I think this, this applies as well to, to coaches who are working with, with their team. As a, as a coach or a yeah. coach developer, you're always you're picking up people from different bus stops yeah. um, and, and you're, you're probably dropping them off in different places. And it, it's not easy. There's that, it's definitely not easy to be a to be someone who's trying to support a group where maybe their, their needs are a bit different or, or they've got different <laughs> motivations for being there. Um, and I don't think we always get it right. And I, I don't think there's ever a perfect coaching session or ever a perfect coach development workshop. But if, if at least you're other centered enough to think about what's important to those people in front of you, then you're well on the way to making a difference. Yeah. And, and I think that's the important thing is that, um, we're not the important person in the room. It's it's everybody else that's the important person. You know, we're we're sort of part way down our journey, and you know, I've put something on a you know a note on a, on on my notes here, and, and it's just that you know that, and if everybody's heard it, but the 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 more I know, the more I realise I don't know as well. So we never stop learning. You know, there's always a different train of thought we can take. There's always different people we can listen to. And I think that's the that's the importance of that that empathy and realizing, you know, where we've been, where we are, and how, how far we've still got to go. Yeah, absolutely. And and do you know what 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 success looks like too? Because for for your, the the coach listening to this podcast who who's who's taking their senior team, or or the coach like yourself, Gary, who's working with that disability group, or the ones you're trying to help with their literacy skills, how you measure success is really different. And yeah. success in your grassroots football session isn't isn't winning. If 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 every time I got asked as as coaching coaching at Arsenal of our development teams, if the question was always how how did you win today or what was the score, I think I'd have probably left. It's, it's yeah. it should be about well, what what was success? Did did this player um, try something out today? Uh, did someone make a new friend? What, what whatever it is, and I think that success needs to be measured very differently to winning and losing when we're when we're working in in development football. And, and developing young people. And, that, and that's more likely going to link into something we're going to come on to later around coaching behaviours, isn't it? Mm. And, and what we do as well. That's a really good point. I think if you've never been exposed to that trail of thought, and again, linking back to a lot of the course and things that we deliver, if you've never been exposed to that or not thought in those ways, it can be quite a, a scary thing to start to address. Um, yeah. And you have to be quite bold, you have to be quite brave because there's other things going on. There's parents, there's opinions, there's the culture of grassroots football and that feeling that I've got to do this or I've got to do that. But yeah. once you start delving into it, um, you know, it, it's just for the purpose of the people that you work with, isn't it? It's just for the benefit of them. So the more open minded you can be, which is easy for us to say now, yeah. but actually to delve into it and to just go, well, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to start by asking a few more questions or I'm going to start by not speaking for 10 minutes yeah and something like that is you've got to train yourself if it's something you've never done before and it, it takes time and people who work in sport or coaching as a profession they've had that time yeah i think that's a really good point Andy, that you said there you, we you know we, we we're training ourselves and so i, I see it as a, a comparison to to a, a child learning any sport so if, if they're learning different aspects of sport, they learn them bit by bit, piece by piece. Um, and coaching is exactly the same. Um, and I used to think that coaching was easy. You know, you, you sort of rock up with a bag of balls and, and some markers or some cones and, and, and you just crack on. 
and yes you can coach like that and, and as long as you give the kids a good time that's that's good coaching however when you're looking at the softer skills and what you've said there about questioning challenging etc you know how we talk to people how do, how do we make people feel do they come to training or a game with a smile on their face because they 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 can't wait to get into that environment then that but we have to learn that we can't start coaching and be that coach as all three of us weren't that coach years ago i mean it might not scare the life out of us if somebody showed us some footage of us going back however many years because we've we've evolved oh god i gary i mean i shiver <laughs> yeah, I, shiver, I shiver at the thought oh my god <laughs> yeah yeah exactly <laughs> do, do you know andy you're right though to, to try something new as a coach or to to maybe think about coaching in a different way is a bit scary and and maybe we're we're conditioned to an extent about what good coaching looks like and and lots of us th think of parents coming on level one courses which i think is a brilliant thing to do by the way um the starting point is probably the way that you were coached 15 years ago um and and things have probably evolved a little bit since then so just by putting yourself in a position where you don't know the answers shows shows some level of vulnerability um and and by taking some kind of risk and putting yourself in a position where you don't know all the answers to this stuff is brave and and i think for anyone who does it and, and wants to try and learn new stuff should be should be kind of celebrated um and then our role as coaches or coach developers if you're coaching the kids and they're trying stuff out in the practices or if you're supporting a group of learners on a course if you can if you can champion that and you can celebrate that that people are being bold and brave then then I think you're, you're you're kind of you're winning as such you're doing lots of the right things to to help people along their way I think, um, I think on that Tom as well and Andy I think that we we've, we've come a long way as a as um, an organization in the type of coach education that we actually deliver now as well because <clears throat> certainly years ago I, I didn't like coach education as it as it stood um because it, it used to be a matter of um, and i don't know if you found this tom and andy it used to be a matter of um as long as you can replicate what the tutor does hmm. uh, then you'll do all right well there's more to to finding out how to coach than that so now i'd like to think we give people a more rounded experience and a better appreciation that you know there is more than one way of, of, of getting to an outcome hmm. and you're actually you're actually um, prompted to try and to try and experiment and be innovative to come up with different ways that's in the context of who you work with. So as long as you can have a rationale and justify why you're doing it and what group of players this is going to affect, that's that's the whole point of coaching. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. And and like context is king, isn't it? Because you take the principles of a level one or a level two course now, which I, and I completely agree with you that the design and the structure of the the, the course is is so much better because it's focused mm. around the needs of the learners. And and if you go back on an old old style level one where you had several games to learn, and then you you, <laughs> you de deliver one at the end of the course, and you're told if you're a level one coach or not. Um, and and now you can just you can take that content and and you can apply it to your under 18s. You can apply it to your under eights. It's about just 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 taking the right bits and adapting them for your your context. Yeah. I think a phrase uh, we spoke about, Gary, when we, we were chatting the other day was about um, not burning up on re-entry. So yeah. um, if I'm bringing this stuff from a coaching course back into my environment, there's some stuff that just isn't going to work um, and some principles that don't necessarily translate to every single age group. But it's about being mindful enough to adapt this adapt the way uh, the how we coach to suit your team and suit your yeah. players and that all comes back again to that point of knowing the people in front of you yeah massively massively do you um just in terms of influences or things that have been sort of key influence or influencers of people or things um what have been the most notable for you so far so if we start with you tom is there anything that stands out for you there's a whole list and and I think that we're, we're probably influenced very consciously by some stuff but but unconsciously as well there's things going on around us in in the wider world and and, and context that, that do have an influence and a bearing too um 
I think first and foremost, the biggest influence on me is the, the, the people that I'm coaching because that they're, 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 they are front and center to absolutely everything I'm trying to do. So that their influence on me is massive because actually I need to know what excites them about coming to training. I need to know what's really important to them about practice and how they want to learn. And I've driven away from many coaching sessions thinking, oh, I could have done that better. And I did that, 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 what I said then, it just didn't land as well as I wanted it to. And you're always trying to refine and, and edit the kind of work that you're doing to, to have the biggest impact on them. So that they're, they're a huge influence. Um, I, I think also perhaps as coaches, and this is a, a point for maybe everyone listening to kind of reflect on as well, do we only listen to people who confirm the way that we see the world? So if, if, if we're not too care, careful, um, our, um, our, our Twitter feed and our coaches we speak to and, and where we read could just become this big echo chamber where you just hear the same messages reverberating around. And I think sometimes it's really useful to, to find, find and seek out people who could be that critical voice or, yeah. or, or someone who, who looks at the world in a completely different way. I was on a webinar at work last week and uh, we had a guest on who, who coaches and teaches at the other end of the spectrum to where I'd, I would almost put, put my mark in the sand. So I would consider myself someone who engages with people and social learning and we learn together. And, and this chap is very behaviorist. So it's his way or the highway. And these are the way you, this is how you approach my, my lesson. And this is how you do stuff. And I kind of came out of it thinking, oh, there's some stuff he said that I disagree with, but it reaffirms what I believe. But really importantly, I think it said, well, nothing is ever entirely right or nothing is ever entirely wrong. And as coaches, I think it's about finding that balance, which is right for you. Um, so yeah, the, the kids are my coach. Um, and uh, kind of looking at people who don't always confirm your your way of thinking. Um, and maybe, maybe just thinking outside of our world of football sometimes, um, look, kind of searching on the fringes of that world. So for example, um, if you want to think about empathy and you want to think about relating to people really well, maybe go and speak to some nurses because actually they're, they're, they're quality at that. Um, if you're thinking about differentiation and challenge and support, well, teachers teachers have to deal with classes of 30 kids every day and, and have with all different kind of challenges and needs. So that there'd be an amazing resource to tap into. So it's not, fo football has got so many answers, but there's so much stuff outside of our world that could really help us too. Mm. Absolutely. And Gary, how about you in terms of, is there any, personal moments that have really influenced you along the way so far um i think i think the main influence really for me has been me me dad um although i didn't appreciate it at the time mm -hmm. and i know it sounds a bit strange saying that but um he just instilled um values and beliefs behaviors for for me to 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 see as good practice, if you like. As a teenager, I didn't really appreciate it, as, as any teenager wouldn't. But I've found myself turning into him as I've got older. And I, I've, I, I still value the, the, the things and I hold them dear. Um, you know, just, just, you know, the important things in life. And I try to bring that to, to what I do. And, you know, if, we, if we're, if what, what's important in 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 our lives and yes football might be important but what what aspects of football are important and as tom intimated to earlier you know what's success and if success is only winning then we're going to end up disappointed a lot of times um there needs to be more than success so like i said just now if if my kids are turning up with a smile on their face they're going home with a smile on their face whether that be to training or a match day that to me is success because it shows that I'm creating the right sort of environment. Um, a lot of learners influenced me. Uh, I had a deputy head, female deputy head teacher on a course years ago and she knew absolutely nothing about football at all. So A, I was, I was really um, impressed and influenced that she was strong enough in her character to come on the course, first of all. And she actually had a word with me and said, Look, I'm really am comfort zone. I said, well, that's that's good. Um, so I might up the front of the class. <laughs> um, but 
but then she put on one of the best practices I've ever seen. It's uh, I think it was on a youth mod one course actually, and it was uh, she she took this game into like the galaxy and planets and spaceships and aliens and stuff like that. I said to her after, you know, although it's taken a lot for you to, all, I said all you've done is use your skill set. You've used your imagination. You've linked it to what you do on a regular basis. And I said that was by far the best session I've seen for, for months and months and months. And I, I would put that on with any group of children. And the, your communication within that was was fabulous as well because of where you've come from. So I think people maybe um, perceive that you have to work in a certain way and you have to say certain things to be a football coach. It's not about that. It's about it's about caring about people in front of you. I think that that's what it's all about. And I think as far as excuse me, my phone's going off. <laughs> um, uh, it's only me, Governor. Um, so I think that that's all that's important. How do I make the person feel in front of me? Um, and a lot of the time they won't they won't remember what you're saying. They won't remember what they've learned. However, they will remember how you made them feel on that on that course. I, I just think they're the lessons I've learned. Um, Damien Hughes, I've, I've, I've listened to a fair bit of Damien Hughes about building cultures as well. And I think we can, a lot of people can take a lot of lessons from Damien Hughes. I mean, he works in the elite, you know, with, with, um, with Barcelona. He's worked with elite athletes, uh, elite organisations. However, um, we can take it right back to grassroots football. Uh, can we build the appropriate culture within our club, within our team, that's mm. going to give the best learning experience for the people that we've got in front of us? Mm -hmm. I think that's the one of the most important things. And then, as Tom said, there's there's loads of people along the way. Um, two or three teachers really influenced influence me, um, and they were more likely the people who treated me like a person, like an individual, and actually listen to what I said. Whereas a lot of teachers, when, when I was growing up, um, it was like old coaching. Um, you did what you was told and you followed direction. And if you didn't, there was consequences, uh, yeah. which is ludicrous. Um, so I think that the there was more like teachers ahead of their time who cared about us as actual individuals. They knew how to make lessons interesting not just delivering the lesson in the same way for everybody because we wasn't really all interested in that so as tom said earlier about differentiation so can we change things up for some people although we're working on a similar thing uh, um, and also you know equally the same as i'm not copying tom um find a critical friend so find somebody that so don't get in a, into a little silo with people who just have the same opinion as you because that does you no favors at all uh, and certainly if you're if you're if you're the most intelligent person in the room change rooms because that's not doing you any good either so be in an environment where you've always got somebody you can inspire you you can learn off of i think that's massively important as well and i've been in a lot of environments where i've had that so Critical friend, very important. Somebody who's not frightened, somebody you respect, and they're not frightened of telling you their opinion and not necessarily agreeing with you. Excellent. Thanks both for that. Um, it leads us quite nicely. It's almost like it's planned, Gary, uh, into um, coaching behaviours. <laughs> so I'm just going to, if you don't mind, Tom, I'm going to put you on the spot for a second, just in terms of your role and the experiences and kind of looking from a UK coaching and personal point of view. So with regards to coaching behaviours, just trying to unpick that a little bit. So what do you think for any coaches listening now is a good starting point for, I suppose, understanding why they do what they do? So what would be a good place to, where would be a good place to start? To understand why they do what they do. I think, I think that's a great question. Um, I, when I was at the FA, uh, there was a coach educator who was head of, uh, head of coaching at Fulham now, Ben Bartlett. He, he asked me three great questions that I think are a brilliant starting point for coaches. Why do you coach the way that you do? Who are the players in your care? And how would you like the game to be played? And I think they're awesome questions when it comes to thinking about your, your behaviours, but also your, your philosophy as a coach. 
because actually if you're not if you're not kind of conscious about who you're trying to impact on if you're not really conscious on the football stuff because that that if, if you're trying to help players develop in football you need to know a bit about football uh but as the saying goes you need to know a bit more about them um so i think asking yourself those questions is a is a great starting point when it comes to coaching behaviors though and and for any coach um i don't think it matters if you're working with with the 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 under eights or 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 a senior team in the premier league i think being positive and being consistent are absolutely massive because ultimately if, if you those kids which turn up into your coaching session that that could be the best part of their day the best part of their week they've been looking forward to this since since session the session ended last week so if you're able to kind of be that positive consistent and unconditional person um i think that's a brilliant starting point and and there's so much more which then that could lead into um but i don't necessarily think that that those things take a huge amount of practice i think it, it, it may require probably some patience and they they require some some reflection as well to make sure you can get better and better at these things but i think it's a great place to start thanks gary is there anything you wanted to add to that to that bit no i i, I agree with uh, what, what tom said there and I, 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 I totally agree that you know ben is an excellent um educator and and i'm sure he goes have a great career at fulham as well and he's, he's got some great messages and, uh, and i think ben was the first person i knew who who was willing to share as well so i i, I everything that i ever went on with the fa um i'm not not decrying the fa <laughs> uh, but everything i ever went on prior to going on something that ben was doing was um, i think it was a cpd if any did uh it was almost as if uh, we we had the holy grail and we we couldn't we couldn't share that information with anybody or want to share that information with anybody some people more likely um, just in case somebody had the same information as us uh, but i remember at the end of the the, the cpd ben said um i will send you all these slides and i was i was quite taken aback uh, because he was willing to to share everything that he'd given us and I, and again that i suppose I, i've i've copied that behavior from ben and i've not got a problem with sharing anything any information that i've got as long as it's not embargoed um so i think that's massively important um i think it's important that coaches learn to to, to share information as well i remember a, a quick story of I was doing a, a coaching session um, and it was it was a CPD event actually and it was on Canby and we had a few people there um, and I was doing some work with um, Curve Coaching and there was a guy from a, a local club in South End who was standing next to me and he said I had a fabulous experience a couple of weeks ago I was lucky enough to go to Ajax um, and I spent two days there and that was really accommodating you know sort of open open house I said, that's fabulous. He said, I've come away with so much information. I said, well, that's really good for, you, for your club, isn't it? And he went, oh, no, it's only for me. It's only for my team. And I said, well, I said well, what's, what's the point of that? I said, why not share it with, with your fellow coaches? So it's, it, people are very insular sometimes if we're not careful and we work in silos. Um, and maybe we're going to get on to talk about you know what, what clubs can do to create a better environment with their coaches and stuff like that but that was one of the things that um came to mind just come into my head really um so yeah i think it's about uh, again going back to to caring for people um from grassroots to senior football create a good environment and that environment people want to enjoy themselves people want to learn people want to feel safe and by feeling safe, I mean safe in the fact that they know that if they if they happen to mess something up, they're not going to get ridiculed. They're going to be supported. They're going to be helped. They're going to be guided. And you're there for them. You're not there for for any other reason. And I think that that's a thread from from grassroots to senior football, or it should be. And there's some great examples of that at senior football. 
and, and I suppose equally you can see some some poorer examples from time to time as well. But I think they're the key things in, in supporting people. Realise how they want their information. Um, learn how to communicate effectively with people. Um, so if we talk, we always talk about interventions now on, on courses and when do we go in and give information? And I suppose the three things I'd say is we'll think about before we go in to, to intervene. Why are we going in? Who are we going to speak to? And what are we going to say? They're the three things I would say before we actually stop a session. I suppose it's um, saving it up almost, isn't it? So if you're going to go in and you're going to stop them enjoying doing what they're doing, it better yeah. be worthwhile. Yeah. So, you know, and it may, you know, again, some people will be familiar with this. They might know more than others, but, you know, it might be that drive by, fly by, whatever you want to call it, where you just speak to an individual. And I've certainly found in my coach, and that's something that can probably go too far the other way, but probably do yeah. pretty much no uh, group or a whole team interventions because it's all just individuals, because perhaps that's become a bit of a comfort zone for me because I feel more comfortable having those discussions now. And it's all just habits. But yeah. I think, I suppose the message would be just to experiment. And that's something that we try to advocate yeah. as much as we can, don't we, through through the course, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think, I think, yeah, sorry. Go on. Oh, I, think, I think also um, going back to, to, to creating them environments and, and knowing how people, people learn and want information, I think it's important also to to sort of emphasise, you know, everybody that's been on a course now will, will have heard of the four corner model. Um, and I think we have to be mindful that we, and, and guard against just focusing on the technical side of the game. I think it's, there's so much on the right hand side of those four corners that's massively important. And if you don't get them things right in the in, in the social corner, in the psychological corner, then it doesn't really matter what you're going to try and do technically. And I think that links into the to the, the, a lot of the softer skills and the questioning and uh, the appropriate challenges when, when coaching groups of people. Gary, I'd love I'd love to build on a couple of things that you talked about yes. um, because I've been sat here making copious notes. So um, <laughs> no, 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 it's brilliant. I, I love listening. Um, I think the, the the point you made about psychological safety is really important. That that how of kind of how do coaches create uh, an environment where people feel like they can they can just go and try stuff out, um, and and it's probably more than just that tokenistic, be, be appearing tokenistic, saying give it a go. It's almost being consistent with that, so so people kind of truly believe you. Um, and and with your story about the coach who went off to to Ajax, um, someone said to me once, uh, "There's no exclusive ex no." no, no I can't get my words out. There's no exclusivity on progress, yeah. uh, which I think is a nice turn of phrase to think about. Oh, well, yeah, if, if you're doing something, you think it could benefit other people, then then, yeah, share it. Um, and and, and the, there's so much, so much really interesting stuff coming out about coaching behaviours at the moment. There, there's been some insight and some some research done. And it really echoes that point you just said about the psych and the social side of the four corners. Um, one of the phrases I used to use when we were at Arsenal was was about uh, coaching players from the head down rather than the feet up, and I think that that if, if you if you just focus on the technical physical stuff, then you you really do limit the potential of the person because mm. for everyone who's been on an FA coaching course, the, the 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 five C's or the six C's that are highlighted in the psychological corner. Well, if you take confidence, for example, well, if you don't help someone develop their confidence. Uh, on the ball and off the ball, then they'll never fulfil their potential uh, technically. So the, these things have to be at that that solid foundation of of what you're doing as a coach. Yeah, hundred percent, Tom. Absolutely. Um, the, just to pick up on that point there, Tom, about just give it a go um, from the coach to the player. Um, mm. I think we we can really live that as coaches, can't we? And set the example. And you mentioned vulnerability earlier as well. So if I as a coach can just give things a go and experiment and, and try different types of practices or or one day, I, I, you know, perhaps I'm quite a commanding type coach and then all of a sudden I start asking a few more questions or taking a bit more of a step back, it, call the players bluff almost if you like. And it's just something a little bit different. And I think it keeps 
it can keep them on their toes a little bit, but it also shows that you're willing to try new things as well. And, you know, even if just some open reflection say, you know what, it didn't really work today. Um, and for them to hear that, I think that can go such a long way to just creating that environment again, can't it? Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, exactly. And do, do you know, there's, there's some research out there at the moment around um, uh, coaching behaviours. And there's a, there's a famous researcher who's done loads of work around youth sport called Jean Cote. Um, yeah. And and he he's identified these 11, 11 behaviours that coaches can show on a regular basis that have a transformational impact on, on the young people in their care. Um, and as, as soon as I heard the words transformational coaching, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm interested in this. <laughs> So 11, 11 really clear behaviours, which are like, I'll give you a couple of examples. So mod modelling pro-social stuff. So that vulnerability and humility. So if, uh, right, you, you coaches have had this period of time through lockdown where they haven't coached, but they've been immersed in this world of learning. And I'm sure there's loads of coaches who are really excited about going and trying some new stuff out. Um, and that's a great opportunity to say to the, say to the young people, well, look, I've, I've been doing some research next week we're going to we're going to have a go at something it might not go very well but let's let's see how it goes and unconsciously you're sending a message to your players there to say right it's, it's all right to take a bit of a risk it's all right to just just try stuff and if it doesn't work that's all right we can we can laugh it off we can talk about it we can get the input from the players um and and by by modeling that as the coach it gives permission to the players that you're working with to, to try it out for themselves Absolutely. I think also um, linking into what you've just said there, Tom, I think that with the, it's a really important thing to realise for, for the coaches of younger players as well that we, we need to try not to suppress creativity. So if we're always telling our players to pass the ball because that's what Barcelona do or well, that's what Man City do or Liverpool do, um, then we, we're doing them a disservice and, we're, and, we're, and we're, we're cramping their style, really. Players, young players want the ball. They wait a long time to get the ball in a game because it doesn't come around too too often. So when they get it, they want to try and do as much as they can with it. And we, and we should applaud that, really, um, and try and try and promote that creativity and get them to be expansive and innovative and experimental. Um, and then when they get a little bit older, then we can start, and once they can make better decisions about and appreciate maybe where their teammates are, then maybe we can start thinking about passing and support and movement and things like that. But we can't start teaching creativity when the kids are 10, 11, 12, because by that time, they'll have been told that they, they can't be creative. So then it'll be too difficult to try and instill it in them. So I think that's massively important as well. And that's part of the fun for young players is, and that's part of the enjoyment is they want to be expansive and, and show you what they can do. Yeah, hugely Gary. And, and Pete Sturges talks about it a lot, doesn't he? About kind yes. of mastering the ball, lo loving having possession of the ball. Yeah. And and I've kind of, I've picked up that there might be the occasional critic who say, well, are you just encouraging players to hog it? Well, it's it's not it's not that, is it? It's not about hogging the ball at all. It's about it's about being comfortable while you're under pressure. It's yeah. about having a connection with the ball, and and it's all it's I guess it's a football fundamental in a way because if if you if you're not helping your players master these things and feel feel comfortable in with in possession at a young age, then then the the older they get, the harder it becomes to be able to transfer that skill or transfer that knowledge. Definitely. I think if you, um, if for anyone that has children, I suppose, young children, I suppose, I suppose it probably goes for any age, and they have a new toy or an item, and the first thing they want to do is look what I can do. Uh, yeah. you know, look what I've found that I can do. And they might not even be able to speak, but they might just smile. And it's they've discovered that for themselves. And the reward that they get for that is immense, probably more than we they'd ever get from us giving them praise. Because they've achieved it themselves. Look what I've done. You know, those that can't, mummy, daddy, look what I've done. And that, that's a great moment. And that's it's a good moment just to capture, I think, if you're a parent coach, is those moments really count. And in terms of learning, without going too deep into it, that's probably going to be one of the most effective things for them. So giving them opportunities to do that. So I always refer to playground football because that's just basically a load of children going, look what I can do. 
Mm. And if they can't do it yet, they're going to watch a friend that can, and then they're going to try it and they're going to fail. But, you know, and eventually some of them might just walk off <laughs> or they might take the ball away. But they'll they'll be able to regulate that in a way themselves that I think we can learn so much from as coaches, just yeah. observing those those behaviours, I suppose. I think it's um, I think it's important as well. To, and I, I know I've had conversations with with people in the past, and I, you know I'm talking about coach educators now, and, and maybe um, um, better qualified coaches around. We 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 need to guard ourselves about being complacent, don't we? Because we we know that it's good to 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 let the players, you know try things to experiment to to let them off the leash and to just have a go at stuff however maybe some coaches haven't got to that stage yet and it's 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 easy for me to to release the power that some people might perceive a coach has got i almost want to make myself redundant as a coach if i'm working with young players and then i use the other skill sets to to like you said andy i'm observing so what I might be observing is well, who's actually doing that well? Who who actually needs a little bit of support? So if somebody needs a little bit of support, I might have that I might have that individual inter, inter, intervention with them. Um, there might be some people, and I might then say to them, okay, so uh, what do you think we can do now? How can you change yourself more? Now, I know full well that as a a more novice coach, I wouldn't have done that. I would have been telling people what to do, when to do it, uh, on a command, and and that that's a form of coaching. But I didn't realise there was different ways of doing the coaching at that time. So I think we all we all go out with the view to to do the best we can. Um, but as we become more experienced, we gain more tools to to utilise at the right times. And that's all part of our learning, the same as our players are trying to learn. Andy, going back back to the point you made earlier about about kids, there's a quote that I love that I have kind of stuck to my laptop. Um, it says, "If we could all see the world through the eyes of a child, we would see the magic in everything." Um, and I think that's a great reminder to coaches to say, "Well, actually, the, the, the young people in our practices do see see football from a different point of view to us," um, yeah. and it's important to 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 understand that and help them ap approach everything with curiosity so yeah. it's hard to teach creativity but we can create an environment <laughs> where kids can be really creative um so if by like, like gary says rather than telling maybe think about what what might you ask or what what do you notice while you're watching a session that then you might be able to go and have a one-to-one a -one chat with one of the kids about and not necessarily approaching a conversation to say I'm going to give you some advice. It's well, maybe a, a, approaching a conversation with some curiosity around why someone's done something, asking some extra questions. Um, then we gain a better understanding of what their intentions are, and then we probably are in a better place to try and help them get better at whatever they're trying to achieve. Um, and, and I think, yeah, children, young children are are incredibly creative in in the way they they see the world because there's not as many constraints there as perhaps us as adults put on things. Um, and and it's about embracing that because actually there's there's many many times there's more than one right answer. Yeah. And to them, anything is possible, isn't it? I was had my hand forced slightly to uh, download, subscribe to uh, Disney Plus. <laughs> <laughs> Not anyway. But it was just fascinating. I've always always been a Disney fan. I'm sure lots of people are, and it's just something that even as an adult, I continue. And it's just an excuse now. I've got children that I can watch some of that stuff again. <laughs> but <laughs> Walt Disney, if anyone's ever read up about him or watched any of the stuff about him, he was an absolute master at that developing the curiosity and that creativity to just capture imaginations. Now, if you can go anywhere near that in terms of your coaching and just sparking the flame, igniting the flame as a coach to go, you could try this or give it a go. Or I've actually heard someone say before, I bet you can't. And that was to their own child. And yeah. actually, when I think about that and how perhaps your own children would work, and it's probably better just with your own children to go, actually, that's just made them think, go on, I bet you can't. And it's like a you know, little challenge. Can you throw that ball into a cup or whatever it may be? But just sparking that. Now, the 
the whole industry around Disney. I've been watching a, a documentary about it and about how it all came to be and Disney World, Disneyland, and literally the whole thing is based on creativity and letting go of the reins and going, what can you guys do? What can you create that's going to be just amazing to these young people and to adults as well? Now, I, I, for me, that was just such a, an amazing thing to watch unfold. And obviously, it's years and years and years in the making, but it's all built on those fundamentals of curiosity and excitement. I think for the for in the coaching world, it, I think that that just stuck for me. I thought it was a, a really powerful moment. Um, just just conscious of the time a little bit there, and I'm, perhaps there might be some bits we can pick up at the end. But just to, as a final topic, um, we said about accessing support. So. Yes, there's courses, um, you know, so Essex FA run courses, the FA run courses, there's resources that we can access and the same would go for, for UK coaching as well, of course, Tom. Um, other than those things, what support do you feel is out there or people could access to help them develop as coaches, given that a lot of the people we deal with are, are time poor, um, have lots of other commitments and often they've just been the last one to step back. Gary, do you want to kick us off or shall I, shall I give you? I'll take a chance because I've just unmuted myself because I've got a bin bin outside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> First world problems. Eh? Um, I think I think as Tom said earlier, we need to we need to look further than just the sport we're in. There's some there's some excellent people out there. Um, one of the podcasts I've been listening to over recent or through the lockdown, and I've been listening to a huge amount. Um, I've listened to a couple of Toms as well, uh, which has been very good. Um, Simon Mundy, who's got a Radio 4 um, show, he does podcasts, and it's all around um, life lessons and life skills. And he speaks to different athletes and different people who have achieved um, so one might be gratitude, one might be humility, one might be um, um, assertiveness. And some of the stories are so powerful, but I think you can actually link a lot of what's spoken about to our situations as individuals, no, ma no matter what environment we're in, and take, unpick it for your own benefit and take the messages from it to suit you. Um, and, and going back to what I said earlier, I'm very much about the the simple things in life and the important things in life and the values and behaviours and maybe the role modelling that we do and the examples we give and the, the boundaries we may be set. And I don't think them things change. And you can pick that information up across so many different vehicles. Like I say, Simon Mundy, uh, Damien Hughes around culture. Um, Tom, we was talking about Stephen Rolnick was on one of your webinars. Stephen Rolnick, very, very powerful, very powerful um, as well. Clinical psychologist. But a great, and some people might hear that and go, oh, God's clinical psychologist. I couldn't listen to that. But it's the messages that come out from it that we can we can take from it. And I found him really powerful, the way that he put that information over. Um, I'd, I'd guard, I'd just warn people to guard against just trying to take everything on board. Um, there's so much, there's so much content being put out at the moment, and some of it may need, may not be applicable to to you at your stage at the moment for your players at their stage of learning. So I know a lot of people get caught up in formations, analysis, etc. If you're working with the players of an age that that's important, then great. If you're working with an age, with an age of player who who um, don't necessarily need that, and they need everything we've spoken about pretty much on this on on this recording around the environment. The way we make people feel, caring about people, having em empathy, having humility. They're the important things for most young players to cater for their needs and wants. 
um, recognizing their value and believing in them. They're the, they're the important things, you know, through the vehicle of football or, or any other sport. Um, so the formations will come later, the analysis will come later. Analysis could be well, how many times did Jimmy pass the ball successfully in the first half? That's that's analysis at a base level. We haven't, we haven't necessarily got to, to, to download all sorts of um, different information. So keep it in perspective. Take take what's relevant for you in your own context as we as we started the conversation on earlier, I suppose. So some some awesome points, Gary. Uh, and and you know what, you really got me thinking when when you were talking. It, it reminded me of a conversation I had with a, another coach um, fairly recently, and he, he said to me, "There comes a point in your journey as a coach when you need to stop listening to experts and trust yourself." Um, and I, I love that because I think sometimes as coaches we can get fascinated by loads of stuff. Um, we can go off in lots of different directions, and and we've probably all been in that position where we've just been on a course. And then our coaching for the next three weeks looks completely different because we're just trying to replicate everything we've seen on the course. Yeah. Um, I think it, my message to coaches would be to, well, wherever you're looking for stuff, <clears> whether that's <throat> podcasts or webinars or reading, watching videos, listening to this, it, it's, it's all about working out what's best for you and what's going to complement your journey as a coach. Yeah. If we get fascinated by things all the time, that can't, can't always be helpful because it sends us off course. Um, so I think that's something to bear in mind, um, and I think we we are in a in a world where there's almost um, I heard this phrase of uh, infobesity. There's so much information out there; it's really hard to sift between what what's important and what's not. Um, so whatever you engage with, I think it's about doing it with a critical eye. Um, is this going to help me? Is this going to help my players? Or is this something that doesn't doesn't really fit at mm -hmm. this moment in time? And Gary, that's a great point about maybe maybe yes, but maybe not quite right now. Um, understanding what what's what's really important for for the next six weeks, for the next six months, for for me and my players, and it's not a rush. There's no rush in this. Learning happens at loads of different speeds, and it might take people a couple of reads of that book or a couple of listens of that webinar to, for for some of these messages to to kind of make sense. And that's all right. We're we're all we're all kind of approaching this from like I said earlier. We're, we're all at different bus stops, and it's okay to to appreciate that. Yeah. No, so just, points. just to uh, end with, because I've got copious notes as well, and mine's going off in different directions. And just bringing it back into grassroots coaches, so Essex Essex clubs. Um, we one thing we'd like to do more of is yes, there's courses, yes, there's workshops, CPD, there's online content, podcasts, <clears> things. In terms of practical advice for clubs or individuals in co uh, within clubs who are perhaps very passionate about coaching. Perhaps they've been impacted in a really positive way. They've been influenced by a coach educator or something they've seen. And they then look at what goes on within their club environment or general grassroots environment. And they think, I really want to change things. What would be some practical steps? And I appreciate they may be small uh, for people, for clubs to take um, to help develop either their coaches or a small group of coaches within their club. Um, I mean, some of this goes as deep as kind of the cultural side of things, but is, is there anything real top tips that either of you would have for, for those coaches or for those clubs to, to start thinking about that conversation? I, I certainly think we need to do more, more work around um, observation skills. Um, so what are we watching? Why are we watching it? And, and what difference is that going to make? Um, I suppose it's like I said earlier. For me, it's who needs who needs help, who's doing well, who can I leave alone, um, who can I challenge and stretch more, um, and then linked to observations. Uh, I suppose my next thing would be be better at asking questions, and it's been a real passion of mine for about the last seven years. Is learn to learn to get learn to ask better questions and I know that I might um, frustrate some people on courses because I don't tend to pause that well in waiting for answers and I'm ready for the next question sometimes so my 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 challenge my next challenge is listen more and wait for an answer um, so 
think about challenges, think about the questions that we can link to challenges. I think there, there are three, three aspects that I would urge coaches to, to become better at. And if coaches wanted more information on that, they can get it from you, Andy. They can drop me an email and I can send some information going forward. But I think they're key, not only linking to the grassroots game, but but certainly as we go forward and and, and if we want to, you know, if we're ambitious and we want to progress through the qualifications, those three things become key as well. Thanks, Gary. Because without observation, we, we, we've got nowhere to go. Thank you. Um, I was I was scribbling down when you were asking that question, Andy. Um, I think I think to build on Gary's points, and I completely agree with everything Gary's saying. Um, be really curious. So, like like Gary said, ask lots of questions in the right way, um, and and just kind of maybe challenge our other better or other ways we can we can do some stuff together. Uh, be really kind because actually, when we're working in grassroots football, we're all there to support something that's a, a huge community, um, and be brave. Uh, going back to that point of going and trying stuff out um, and and actually just because no one's done it before doesn't mean that, that you can you could be the first you could try it out and you could have a go at it and it might go completely wrong but but we could fail forwards um, and 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 again on Gary's point about listening I, I think that's incredibly important because um, well it, it, it's it's such a skill and and actually it, it's it's a lot more than hearing people. Listening is 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 very very important. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read a poem um, because I, I saw this and I thought it resonates really well. Uh, so it's only a short one, so don't worry. Um, <laughs> the wise old owl sat in an oak. The more he heard, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Why can't we all be like be like that wise old bird? And I think that's a, if, if there's any a message for a coach to take away from this conversation, for me, that would that would certainly be one. Yeah, brilliant. Love that. So, so many places that you could uh, that I picture that as well, um, you know, for the individual with their team or for the whole club. So that's brilliant. I really, really appreciate your time today. Um, thanks for sharing some pearls of wisdom and the journey. And obviously there's various different off shot conversations from that. But I think anyone that's listening in get in touch get you know there's there's support mechanisms there um start the conversation so i think that's that's key um and yes you know we're dealing with volunteers and like we said before there may be time poor but th there's not always huge extra work that needs to be done with this it could just be as some simple as we're going to implement some coaching discussions when we have our managers meeting and that might just be the first little step um, that, that is needed um, with the you know the overall aim of helping the people or the children or the, the players that are within your environment um, really really appreciate it thanks again um, and hopefully we can pick up some further discussions in the future um, we'll uh, we'll post some links to, to the websites and some useful resources as well uh, and the video will be added onto our YouTube channel so thanks again both of you no really enjoyable really enjoyable. pleasure thanks a lot take care bye bye